Mesdames, Messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, we are living a unique experience. This is the first time on the European level that we have the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Ministers of Health who have decided to work together. This is a, the first time we've done such an event and it's going very well. It was necessary to organize this. First of all, because there was a very strong European action when the pandemic began to affect all of us, and Madame the Commissioner will certainly talk about that, and also because health has become a geopolitical issue with uh, various and divergent visions, and Europe has its own approach, and it was uh, necessary that we consolidate through dialogue a shared European vision of world health so that in multilateral health organizations we can talk about our objectives, the rule of law, and the fact that health should be a common public good with the universal access to health care. So this is an event that has enabled us to, after this first meeting, which will be continued, uh, followed by a working dinner, to define some of the paths forward. First of all, we'd like to strengthen the uh, European strategy in terms of public health. We would like uh, Europe to have a significant place in the management of world health uh, on a par with its financial contribution. contribution. Secondly, we would like to support low and medium income countries in their approach to combating the pandemic. You know that solidarity is necessary for our own security as well as for the security of others. We need to strengthen the security and we need to strengthen health systems. It's not enough to give money. Madame the Commissioner will talk about the reality of European mobilization at this level, but also what I call the last mile, which is the essential, the essential phase in getting vaccines to people. And finally, we will have a summit of the EU and the African countries in Brussels next week. And of course, the African subject is one that is very important for us in the context of the New Deal that we hope to have with the two continents. And the third path forward is the key role of the EU in developing an architecture for health care. And we work with Dr. Theodos in that regard. These are subjects around which we must mobilize. And the health ministers definitely share this vision with the support of the ministers of foreign affairs. And finally, this will be an opportunity to uh, pay tribute to the many dynamic structures for healthcare in the EU, in particular here in Lyon. We thought it was a good idea to have this meeting in Lyon because here in Lyon we have a dynamic health ecosystem in regard to training, research and innovation with the future perspectives as well as the headquarters of the WHO Academy in 2024. And we hope that France and the EU will become a European global crossroads for health cooperation. And with this project, France intends to contribute to strengthening the multilateral health care architecture, training everyone throughout the world in major health issues. So that is what I wanted to say before Turning the floor over to Madame the Commissioner. Thank you, Jean-Yves, and thank you all. It was a, a good day for EU diplomacy. 
We had a serious working meeting, quite dynamic. People were very engaged with the ministers of foreign affairs and the ministers of health. Together, we have been able to have a, carry out a joint reflection on the basis of on four axes, which uh, Olivier Véran just told us about with regard to public health, the collective response, of course, has to support low- and medium-income countries. We have to have a multilateral approach, Dyn the dynamism of the EU members that welcome many different structures that work in the public health field. This is why we're here in Lyon, because Lyon will soon be the headquarters for the WHO Academy, which will enable us to train thousands, millions of healthcare professionals who can work around the world. Today, we believe that we must support existing structures. We need to continue working and strengthening the work of the WHO. We need to encourage reforms that are necessary in international health regulation. And we need to have uh, see how we can have more effective distribution of vaccines to low- and medium-income countries. And what the French and what the Europeans and, in fact, all citizens of the planet are saying is that there's a deep desire for better health and better well-being, better health through protective systems that will be more developed, more inclusive. In the EU, we have social protection systems which are quite mature. And many countries uh, that have not reached that level of maturity, of course, uh, strive to achieve the same thing. We can therefore influence the rest of the world. We can bring forward this dynamic that will enable everyone to be protected from health risks throughout his or her life. And this is through a strong organization of health care where we try to help other countries develop these systems. So during in the pandemic, we could see that there's the question of human health and also the question of animal health and the health of the environment. So it's not a single health. Everyone knows the expression one health. One health is a very uh, holistic view. It has to do with uh, uh, pollution, with uh, biodiversity. So Europeans must have uh, strong words and also strong actions to promote promote new practices around the world and give more consideration to this, uh, to this notion of One Health, to the One Health approach. And so now I would like to give the floor to Christian Pelidas, who is going to talk about the, co the health in the EU Thank you very much, today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening. First of all, I want to thank the French Presidency and Ministers Le Drian and Veran uh, for hosting the Global Health Conference today and uh, wish, uh, wish them and wish France a very fruitful and successful presidency. There will be many busy months ahead of us in the area of health, as neither the European Union nor many parts of the world are out of this pandemic yet. And today's discussion really was at a very timely, uh, I would say, occasion, uh, given the challenges that we all know still lie ahead of us. The EU must continue its leading role towards a healthier and more equitable present and future uh, in the global community. Now, let me share with you, if I may, today five brief points. Since the beginning of the crisis, Team Europe has provided 46 billion euro in financial support to support and help 130 countries to recover uh, from COVID-19. Almost a quarter of that money, that's about 10 billion, has gone to Africa. Secondly, we have together with WHO co-founded COVAX, the global vaccine sharing mechanism, and we are lead financial contributors with close to a 3.5 million uh, billion euro pledged. Thirdly, together with member states, we have managed uh, to not only reach, but even exceed the vaccine sharing goal that we set, la set last year. And so far we have shared over 407.4 million doses, mainly via COVAX. Fourthly, we have exported half of our, of our total vaccine production. 
whereas others have exported none. And fifthly, we are now working around the clock to achieve our goal of sharing at least 700 million doses by mid-2022, 200 million of which are directly financed by the Commission. However, as I said earlier, when we were uh, in the meeting with all the ministers, donating vaccines is one thing, but ensuring that people are vaccinated is another. And equity demands more than donations. It requires systemic change and access to doctors, to nurses, to hospitals, to medical equipment, to scientists, to technologies, and to research. And last but not least, it requires new manufacturing capabilities. In Kigali, African ministers have put forward the vision of robust healthcare systems and pharmaceutical capabilities. An Africa ready to tackle not merely COVID, but also mal malaria, HIV, tuberculosis, and other diseases. And we are ready to work with Africa to bring about this vision with the EU Africa Summit, which starts next week. We have already launched a 100 million euro initiative to support African um, deployment, vaccine deployment in Africa, with an additional 125 million in funding for African countries for vaccination training, uh, medical equipment and sequencing. And this was announced, this additional 125 million by President von der Leyen today. But we need to go beyond <coughs> COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we must strengthen health systems and immunization capacities of the world's most vulnerable countries. And at the G20 summit, President von der Leyen had actually stressed and announced the Team Europe initiative on manufacturing and access of medicines and health technologies in Africa. And this will be funded by approximately 1 billion euro from the EU budget. Our agencies, the European Center of Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC, European Medicines Agency, EMMA, and our new European Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA, will step up partnerships with our African counterparts to help strengthen preparedness, surveillance, and response capacities. So today we were able to discuss with ministers how we can further support, as the ministers have said, lower and middle-income countries, not just with COVID vaccines, but also to building long-term health resilience and ensuring universal access to medicines. And COVID has shown us, and I think that there is no doubt about it, that health can only be seen in a global context. And we had the opportunity during our discussions today to see how we can strengthen these partnerships which are already there and already have shown fruit in the last uh, two years. So um, with this, I would just say that um, we are ready to continue to work. We are ready to work towards a new, a new, a stronger WHO at, at, at the heart of building a global uh, health ar architecture. Uh, and um, to conclude, I would uh, like to sincerely thank the ministers, uh, restating our strong commitment to, to global health, restating our, our strong commitment to um, a, a new uh, um, a legally binding international pandemic agreement uh, where the negotiations will be starting in the coming weeks. And um, I just want to say that we all know, and it's not just a cliche, that no one is safe until everyone is safe. This is a fact, we know it. Europe will not out be out, out of this pandemic until the world is out of this pandemic, and this is a reality. And today we had the opportunity to see how we can further translate this reality into actions. Thank you so much. Messieurs les ministres, Madame la Commissaire, nous avons quelques questions. Ministers, Madam Commissioner, we will um, take a few questions. First of all, um, Al Lor Vinal, the progress. Good evening. Like you briefly said earlier, why did you choose uh, Lyon for this uh, first um, and rather unprecedented uh, session? Well, it was somehow logical because Lyon is a major city um, when it comes to global health. 
a major city in France for global health. Like I said, by way of an introduction, there was already a, a very dynamic ecosystem, a health ecosystem here. Um, WHO um, has an agency here. We have the um, Agency for Research on Cancer. We will soon have in Lyon as well the uh, um, WHO Academy that was an initiative launched by President Macron. And here there is a huge degree of uh, cooperation between uh, the researchers, the public sector, including on animal health, and there is a very specific um, cooperation with um, the private sector, with Sanofi and Institut Merieux. Um, so it means that there is a, a real um, an outstanding hub in Lyon, and this was a good opportunity for us to, to shed light on the strength of this hub. In addition, it was also an opportunity to uh, refer to uh, the Health Academy that will uh, be working from here, be based here in Lyon as from 2024, so rather soon. So the whole um, health Hub in Lyon. Question from um, Agence France Presse. <coughs> Two questions. To the Commissioner. Uh, a lot of the ministers going in were fairly positive about the, uh, the state of Europe uh, given uh, the vaccination and the data we're seeing in terms of infections falling and death rate. Would you say that Europe has turned a corner? And. Uh, uh, une question pour Monsieur Le Drian. Um, on a vu the question for Mr. Le Drian, we have seen two days of intense uh, diplomacy on the part of President Macron with the promise by Russia not to engage in new escalation in Ukraine. And today we just had the information that Russia wants to close off a part of the Black Sea and most of the Azov Sea for military exercises. Do you think this is escalation? Thank you. For those who have uh, been um, following the beginning of this pandemic for the last two years, and I know that we all have uh, seen how it has impacted on the lives of, of citizens. Um, I, I think, I believe that saying that we have turned a corner, seeing the many twists and turns of this pandemic is uh, not a phrase that at least I would use. What we are seeing is that the largest number of cases now in most of the member states are of the Omicron variant. We are seeing uh, the last uh, seven to eight weeks a stabilization in the number of hospitalizations and the mortality. I think, uh, I believe that there is, um, there is a clear uh, evidence that the vaccines work and vaccinations work, and this is why we have lower hospitalizations and lower mortality. And we are seeing in some member states that have reached a peak uh, with the Omicron. However, uh, I, we say never say never with this pandemic, so we need to be, uh, continue to be cautious. We need to continue to look at the epidemiology of each member state, and we need to continue to encourage citizens to be vaccinated because we know that the vaccinations that are approved are safe and effective, and th they have proved this uh, with the number of hospitalizations and the mortality. And for what is ahead, we will be prepared. Thank you. The question about the Ukraine was not on our agenda this afternoon, so I don't have any particular comments to make about that, except that what the President of the Republic has done in uh, Moscow, Kiev, and Berlin for the uh, past few days are is clear in the declarations that the President has made. Francesco Garasho from Reuters. A question for both ministers and the commissioner. Um, uh, donations of uh, doses of vaccines uh, by the EU have increased exponentially recently. recently. Um, but now we are facing uh, another problem, the problem of ab ab absorption. Many countries uh, do not, uh, do, do actually refuse these doses. Uh, more than 100 million of the doses that you shared have actually not been distributed yet. and. Uh, we know from uh, COVAX uh, data that uh, 
there are countries in Africa that have absorbed, have used uh, less than one third of, of the vaccines that have actually been delivered. So what do you think are the main reasons for this? And uh, do you think uh, vaccine makers have also a responsibility for delivering uh, vaccines uh, with a, uh, to a short shelf life? Thank you. Well, um, thank you for that question. First of all, let's, um, let's look at where we are now. We are now at a stage where 50% of the world's population has now been fully vaccinated. And um, Europe has uh, helped with over 1.7 billion, I think, doses exported to 165 different countries. Uh, but you, I have said before, and I said it in my opening remarks today, that delivering vaccines, and you're right, is, is not enough. We need to ensure that these vaccines, that we are actually having vaccinations. And there are a number of reasons that uh, we have seen and challenges that we have faced. And this is why the president has announced uh, that we're now preparing a vaccine support package, especially for Africa, where the vaccination rate is, is still uh, very low. Um, and because we do not only want to make vaccines available, uh, but it is um, more the fact that we also need to really invest and help uh, develop the infrastructure uh, for vaccinations with more syringes, with more medical equipment, uh, with uh, medical uh, education. Uh, we're working very closely with member states, with the manufacturers and with COVAX to ensure that the vaccines can be distributed, um, I would say more predictably uh, in the places of greatest need where they can be immediately used um, and where the logistics are in place so there will be a minimum uh, risk of wastage. So um, this is uh, key to us working forward uh, and it is indispensable to be able to really deliver and also have the absorption capacities in, in, in place. Um, thank you. I think that this is one of the big questions that we're facing right now, in particular with regard to Africa. The problem is, uh, in my opinion, no longer how much we can give, although we must have to be, we must take care that we continue to give enough. Uh, it's not a problem of production anymore because there are projects for producing vaccines in, in other countries, including in Africa, Senegal, South Africa, Rwanda, Egypt. There are projects everywhere so that the vaccines could be produced. High quality vaccines could be produced quite quickly in these countries. The problem is getting the vaccines out to the people, what we call, again, the last mile. That is, the vaccine has to get make it into arms. It has to get there technically and also culturally, I would say. And this twin movement requires a special care, depending on the different cultures and the different countries involved, and they need uh, support. And we need the support of uh, the WHO and the African Union to have a successful campaign. But it's true that the figures for vaccination rates in Africa are low, and part of that is a problem of communication within Africa and also logistics and also some resistance to vaccines. But if we could get over the logistics obstacles and if we could have enough personnel on the ground to give the vaccines, I think that would be a big step forward. And that's what's uh, super important for us now. Yes, when we look at UNICEF, UNICEF, it has a whole campaign for Benin and uh, Sierra Leone where they're financing uh, nurses and volunteers with a whole logistics. Uh, obviously, it's not the same as when you're trying to distribute uh, vaccines in countries where you have hospitals and health coverage and nurses. It's much more difficult when you're in a country that doesn't have a whole national health system that is as mature as the health systems we have in Europe. And for some people, in some places, you have to keep the, the vaccine at a very cold temperatures, and then it has to be uh, transported 
transported in very secure conditions. You can't shake it up too much, for example, in, uh, on bumpy roads. So it's very complicated. But it is a priority. Uh, Minister Le Drian has just said that. When the vaccines arrive in these countries, they have to be used. You can't, it's not enough just to leave them uh, on the tarmac, uh, in the port, at the airport. That's where the work begins today, and that's where Europe is supporting low and medium income countries to develop their own systems alongside NGOs. And this will be one of the subjects of next week's EU African Union summit. We have time for one more question. Madame Afida Banyakoub. Good evening. The question regards data protection. For example, in, in Belgium, in Brussels, today the, an ID card is now a health card, so it's all in one card. And uh, do you think Europe is moving towards this idea of an ID and health card combined? And with regard to data protection, I know enough efforts are being made, but will there be greater harmonization in the 27 countries, more effective data protection? And a third point, having to do with cybersecurity, the fact that Indeed, people, uh, we, that people's uh, health data might be available through public hospitals or even through a vaccination campaign. Uh, you could have uh, hackers getting into people's private health data in the Brussels in Belgium that has been the case. So these are three very different questions that have to do with the digital strategy. We recently organized a major colloquium on ethics and data and healthcare data. This was a unique conference, and we have seen how much progress we have made. We've made quite a bit in a very short amount of time in order to coordinate and harmonize digital systems that guarantee free circulation, free movement, and that comply with the protection of people's rights. I think of the European Green Pass, for example, all of the work of harmonization of data that enable every EU citizen to travel freely in the easiest way possible, whereas the rules are different from one country to another. You know, it's different between the uh, one, uh, two dose, three doses, uh, the vaccine pass, the health pass, and so forth. But what I've seen is that there are more than a billion people today that have benefited from this mechanism with, uh, with free care and ethical care guaranteed. Now, it's true that uh, cyber hackers uh, attacking French, uh, Belgian, or American hospitals, you can see that they're all, there's a risk everywhere, and it's not just a European subject. In fact, most of the hackers are located outside of Europe. We know that, and we're fighting against them on an international scale, and we're trying to develop cybersecurity systems. In France, we've been doing that. that uh, Belgium also is developing, as all European states are, and we must have a European strategy in this regard, and this is underway. However, I would not make a link between the vaccine pass and the risk of pirating hospitals. In fact, hacking into a hospital or an information system, it could be an email. Uh, it could be a pay slip. It could be uh, salaries, uh, salaried employees with their email. So I think that uh, it's just about uh, prevention, in fact. Things that you wouldn't do at home, you shouldn't do at work. You have to learn how to uh, launch an alarm. You have to be able to blow the whistle. You have to know how to avoid phishing. But one, I think the vaccine pass does not lead to hacking. Just very briefly, because uh, Minister Veram mentioned that we need to do at the EU level, and I believe that this is a really a hugely important topic. Really, it is um, the the uh, the importance of having a, a harmonisation of data, of having interoperable data, 
so that patients are able to really um, have health care across EU borders in a safe way. And I, I totally agree with you that this needs to be stressed. It, it is extremely important. And it is important because this allows for innovation and this is, allows also for empowerment of data of patients to use their own data. And I just wanted to share with you that we are in the process of uh, coming forward with a proposal for a European health data space, which will exactly be working in the, in the direction that, that you, you have suggested, uh, because we need to remove the technical obstacles, we need to be able to allow data to be interoperable and harmonized, and on the other hand, for this to be done in a safe way. Thank you. Nous vous remercions. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Demain.